Okay, I'll start. Uh, um, this lecture will be not super structured. It's more connecting the dots and I'm talking about things that are interesting for me and that I find, what, what's the face? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Olya? Okay. Yes, I can hear. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. You just I, I just thought that maybe it's not coherent or something. Okay. Uh, so I'll be talking about tendencies here and there and artists from all over the place. And also there will be a lot of mixture of discussions that are ongoing, but primarily focus that I want to keep is motherhood and artistic practices and how to combine this two and um, yeah, how can, how can they affect each other? So several quotes to set the discussion. First one from the book, Things I Don't Want to Know by Deborah Levy where she writes about her own motherhood experiences, but also refers to um, other women philosophers and writers. Mother was the woman the whole world had imagined to death. It proved very hard to renegotiate the words nostalgic phantoms about our purpose in life. The trouble was that we too had all sorts of wild imaginings about what mother should be and were cursed with the desire. We did not yet entirely understand that mother as imagined and politicized by the, so so by the so social societal, societal system was a delusion. The world loved the delusion more than it loved the mother. Another, ah, sorry. Another quote would be from Yulia Kristova and her text on motherhood, where, where she writes about uh, mothers and especially mothers of disabled children who are not only this once until their own death. And she puts it that way. And since the famous crisis of values we're going through really upholds only value which seems to garner overall support, life as a value itself. Courageous mothers are considered the cornerstone of today's civilization, a civilization which has lost its points of reference. And um, to end up conceptualizing of motherhood as it is, I want to um, leave it on the screen and then I'll read parts of it. Uh, to transfer the discussion to the art world. Uh, so how come that in the artistic realm where we all more or less, uh, to which we all more or less are connected, motherhood is still s often seen as a problematic area. And in the article research that Maria Gadavanne and Anna Tomkina had performed. Uh, they found out that usually women artists experience huge conflict of interests uh, when they have to uh, be at the same time a mother and an artist, because they uh, the both of those occupations seem to be very total like it's a and being an artist is a huge identity and being a mother is also like big very consuming identity and uh, when they write about the this type of mother 
motherhood role where mother performs the role of the primary caregiver uh, in this uh, intense motherhood style. Mother artist, the artist who's the mother, uh, significantly limits her participation in art. And yeah, redistributing resources from artistic practice to mothering. And this intense motherhood combined with the lack of resources that allow balance her return to the art scene. So when an artist becomes a mother, it altogether threatens the whole career path of being an artist and can be a reason for abandoning the world of art. Which is also discussed as uh, uh, Yurkova pointed out, and I saved this article from the Guardian that she sent to the group recently uh, about how this article talks, of course, about the um, American uh, situation and how yeah, motherhood is a taboo in the art world. Female artists on the impact of having kids. And this is a sad article, uh, not very connected to the post-Soviet uh, space that much. Because of course, uh, when American artists are talking about art, it's often about selling the works of art. And um, when we're talking about, for example, Russian artists, it's less about selling and more about communities and more about this unpaid activist art that is more visible than actual, for example, paintings for sale. Um, there are several studies, several interesting books that I was basing my conceptualization of motherhood on. And the one I like a lot is The Repro Reproduction of Mothering by Nancy Chadro. It's a quite old one. The newest sample of Woman Born by Adriana Rich. And these are two uh, books that are uh, newer works on motherhood, Mothering in the Age of Neoliberalism and Maternal Optimism. All of these works talk about motherhood and work and how women combine these two. And it seems to me that sometimes when we talk about the artistic world, even though now it is a very precarious space, a space that is uh, full of unpaid labor, for example, uh, it seems like this is a, almost like a big corporate career for women who want to engage in the art world. And it conflicts with motherhood as much as um, like the most ambitious careers would do, which is really sad. And getting back to the topic of self-care and the feminist self-care, I think it's crucial for the artistic communities to rethink this conflict and to find some other approach, especially now when the border between private life and social life is as thin as it never was, I think. And um, yeah, find a new way of dealing with this. Because <laughs> I remember that Recently, I was um, at the exhibition and one of, of my colleagues uh, uh, came to me with this question. She said, uh, how, how are you able to combine motherhood and your artistic practice? And it seemed to me like, well, yeah, it's not ideal, but also what is that artistic practice is that is un... Um, 
uncombinable, un uh, believable to put together with the mother with the Mars motherhood and I knew that her daughter at the time was 16 or 17 years old so it wasn't about time or breastfeeding intervals or nothing that extreme and she said that yeah okay it's not about time but I still need to uh, cook and I can't feel professional when I cook she said that every time when she cooks, she still feels that she smells like cooking and while attending the exhibition, for example, or some fancy opening, she can't feel professional enough because she feels like she's still in this household area. And indeed, it is difficult to feel professional while you are in, always presented as a professional in this spaces um, where there is no household, no children usually. And of course, you are not supposed to smell like food. Uh, corporations like Facebook, Amazon, and who else? Google, big corporations recently offered their female employees to uh, pay for their frozen ads so they can build up their career in their 20s and 30s and then they can start thinking about having children and this option is covered by the corporate insurance which encourages young women to spend more time working and less time thinking about their families. And it shows this clear uh, impossibility of doing two things at the same time. Of course, in, in the American context, it's especially terrible because there is almost no um, child support and social sense and there are very few places which provide women maternity leave or any sort of payments and coverages and it's even now a little bit better in the countries who have social programs but still this big companies shows, show us this impossibility and somehow uh, artwork in a way also repeats it. I want to uh, talk about the figure of artist and the, the way how artists in different times realizing motherhood. For example, we all know this nice and seemingly unproblematic and yeah, soothing works of Renoir, where he paints often uh, his wife and his son, and his wife is either yeah, feeding, breastfeeding their son, sometimes playing with him, and this all seems very nice and, and yeah, like idyllic picture. But in fact, uh, if uh, you read feminist critique of Renoir paintings and when feminist art artists such as Tamar Garb, for example, dig into his um, life and his letters and his diaries, uh, you find out that uh, he was not that harmless and that his paintings weren't that idyllic as such. Uh, he was actually very much against women having their right to vote. And um, even more extreme, he was against women reading, writing. He had this obsession with um, a natural woman, something he imagined to himself and something to some extent, I guess, his wife was to him. 
So this natural woman is just the mother. Uh, she's uh, just connected to some natural nature and is not, uh, she's not trying to penetrate the social world uh, that belongs to men. What would be the uh, more, uh, not this like high art samples of this kind of thinking, uh, that would be this against um, suffragettes and feminists uh, during the first wave where if a woman goes out and has her social life, then uh, a man is immediately thrown into the household realm which she, he can't handle and he becomes feminine and terrible and the children, children suffer, children and screaming and crying and the whole system falls apart if a woman is outside of the household and living her social life not there. So uh, this imagery of a mother and uh, often even like as we see in this Renoir um, representation of motherhood through a woman and a male child uh, there, there is a woman who helps child to grow up, to become a proper person. And Renoir surprisingly was writing a lot about things like breastfeeding and how breastfeeding is important for men to become proper uh, people who are connected to their emotions. And if um, some man wasn't breastfed, then it's, huge problem and of course women should be so Renner basically told women how to breastfeed in order to raise right men and this connection of uh, the mother and the son uh, of course in the Christian uh, imagery is very, very much connected to the icon of the Virgin Mary the mother of God, mother of God, and um, in this case, we have this clear link between uh, male, between a male child and a female mother. Uh, some feminist art historians were trying to rethink this connection. And actually, there is another set of icons uh, that have um, a mother and a daughter, and that would be Anna and the Virgin. Oops, Anna and the Virgin Mary, and then we'll have mother and daughter on the drawing. That uh, this is less popular, but also exists in the Christian imagery and some um, interesting connections can be found. For example, in Germany, there is a church of uh, Saint Anne in the city called Lübeck. And it's a, a huge church that has um, lots of art samples. And interestingly, uh, a Russian born artist Natalia Gonchirova had her first huge European exhibition in this church specifically because they were interested in women artists and she was interested in Christian imagery and was producing a lot of paintings connected to that. So this can be reframed and here I jump to the uh, Eastern European examples now, and I'm, I will talk a little bit about this mother of God imagery in the 
art of Russian art groups. And of course, the first most famous group that comes to mind, maybe not so these days, but I still think this uh, comparison is very interesting and the role of mother and artist as a mother when we're talking about um, artist who is an activist actually, and not just a painter, for example, is very, very interesting. So, uh, Pussy Riot and their uh, punk song, punk prayer, Mother of God, Ch Chase, Putin away that they performed in the huge Orthodox uh, church. They, of course, as now we can see from multiple articles criticizing their approach, uh, were able to connect to the Western uh, audience through adapting this riot girl uh, stylistics uh, that was never that popular anywhere near uh, the Soviet Union, but was indeed very popular in the United States or Europe. And uh, sure, um, I do agree with this criticism, but what is interesting for me is also this connection to the uh, or orthodoxy and to, the, uh, to this imagery, the Christian imagery of motherhood, of mother. And then uh, when they want mother of God to help them, this is something very deeply um, Russian, I would say, maybe even broader, maybe even Eastern European in a way, because when uh, Russians pray, uh, they do not normally pray to um, just God or uh, yeah, no one um, pray, prays to Christ that much in Russia, but the, the, uh, the way to pray is to ask mother of God for something because she's of course all forgiving and she's helpful and she's understanding and she, she can understand every sorrow and every need. And so this motherly figure, uh, especially it was, it was important all over um, the history, but especially um, after the war, when there were almost no men left and this like figure of the mother became very important. And even though religion wasn't in favor back then, somehow it was transferred back and forth Christianity and this like, Soviet uh, imagery were interconnected. And asking mother of God for something is still very much there. So we end up uh, with this motherhood, with this mother of God. But also they are women doing that. And when they are asking mother of God about something, we have this connection that is in between relationship that is in between two women which is also, I think, interesting and um, has a good potential there. As well, uh, the figure, the, not the main, but like one of the uh, activists, artists was at the time um, mother herself and she still is. Uh, she's uh, a mother and she has a daughter and when she was performing this action and was arrested, she had a very young daughter, um, child. And of course, once she was arrested, there was a huge um, debate everywhere. And the debate around her figure specifically was that, how could she risk her own freedom while she's a mother? 
how could she um, leave her daughter alone? And this powerful rhetoric of uh, woman as a mother or activist as a mother, uh, like protecting them, not letting them uh, go out there, protest or protest or make activist actions or do whatever uh, can bring them into prison because they actually are needed at home in their private lives in order to take care of their children. This idea is still there even on a greater extent right now. Because as we know, now during the protests that happened in Russia, as recent as in the end of January this year, the protective, uh, protective and patronizing rhetoric of uh, Russian government was that uh, we should not let our children, of course, you should not go there as a parent, you should never take your children uh, to the protest as a parent, but also you should look after your children who are 15 to 17 years old, which is not really childhood, more of the late teenage, uh, and if they go and participate in protests, potentially that what I've heard parents are afraid of, potentially parents can be charged with child neglect or risking child's health and they can be stripped of their parenting rights. So this protective idea of how uh, the mother could, should not participate anywhere and should not leave the private sphere of her own home is still there 100 years after the Renoir's insistence on the fact that women should not go and participate in public life. Though when it comes to male activists, uh, here, for example, there is a picture of uh, a group Vaina, uh, group that was connected to the uh, Pussy Riot activist group, um, and when there is male activist, no one is usually uh, stressing this fact of parenting. Parenting is not uh, something that men do um, 100% of the time. And so if man artists is um, making risky moves or uh, if, if a male artist is imprisoned, no one tries to blame him for leaving children at home. Usually it's the other way around and male artist is being praised for thinking about the future of his children or changing the system for his children or being that hero who helps to show and so on. That's not the case for female artists though. Uh, another important trope in the uh, Eastern European imagery will be the heroization of women. Uh, there is even a term, uh, hero mother, that, uh, that was used a lot. I remember it being used when I was a child, but I, I'm not following it that much. I don't know if it is used now, but uh, as, as I remember, Hero is someone who has more than three children. So if you are able to raise more than three children, you consider to be a hero. And uh, then this uh, powerful working woman um, who I'd say started to that Mouhin embodied it in her sculpture to a certain extent, this like power, powerful 
um, almost an androgyn, androgynous looking woman who's able to work a lot. Uh, her sculptures were sometimes reviewed by people like, oh, this sculpture, this female body looks like she should be even like able to give birth without making a sound, like this kind of heroic mother and heroic woman and just like heroic, heroic worker who can also be uh, seen as the embodiment of this motherland. This is a, a Russian version of Rodina Mats, that would be uh, motherland mother or country mother. This is the Ukrainian version, this kind of like a victory sculpture statue. Uh, of course, uh, this heroic women are usually anonymous, they're just symbols. Um, that is also an interesting contrast between having um, sculptures of men and sculptures of women and sculptures of men uh, are usually uh, dedicated to some specific man. And sculptures of women often present um, and with no, um, with no specific, with no uh, specific woman behind it. And this heroization of womanhood and motherhood found, uh, found uh, its own very interesting uh, reflection in the art of Eastern European artists. One sample would be a Polish artist. Here I hope that I pronounce her name correctly. Elżbieta Jabłonska. Uh, where she interestingly connected the idea of heroic motherhood with the contemporary ideas of heroes. And her mothers that she took photos of are presented in costumes of superheroes, but at the same time they are uh, shown in their domestic environments with their children. Uh, another artist of this um, trope, as I see it, would be Anna Fabricius. She's a Hungar Hungarian artist. And uh, she also uh, created those domestic labor, caring labor icons with women doing their day-to-day -day activities, but presented in this iconic way. Um, not often uh, you, you see the domestic realm being, being so soaked into the artistic sphere. This, these are works that I particularly like and uh, the artist is present in our discussion. Uh, she's, she's somewhere there listening. Works by Yekaterina Shitkova where she poses as uh, those women, not exactly heroes, but it is still an attempt to, what do I have here in chat? <laughs> yeah, she's writing. Um, yeah, so uh, not as heroes, but as some I iconic female, uh, figures, but she's not posing anywhere outside of her 
domestic, not not necessarily domestic, but day-to-day -day routine routine is here. And here is um, also there is some orthodox trait here, but it is a kitchen and there is a child present. And the next one uh, is a uh, circus, but the circus performed in the in the room of artist's son, where he's taking place. Uh, children usually are excluded from the academy altogether and excluded from the even when you think about exhibition it's hard to think about where where will the children be children feel super uncomfortable on the openings that often have um late late timings and then big crowds and this is not a child-friendly environment but in the Eastern European countries, it happens so. And I think it, it's, uh, it is very, um, it has good sides and bad sides. And uh, the good side of uh, living in the Eastern European country or post socialist country that is poor and probably doesn't have that big of a resource uh, to start with. And so academies, artistic academies, even if they are there, are not that um, spectacular. And uh, when you're doing the, your diploma show, for example, you can do whatever and also experiment with this uh, easy environment. And, and this is the artwork from the late 90s from um, the post-Soviet Czechoslovakia or in the middle 90s, it was like, nah, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, more or less, uh, where uh, the artist, Lenka Klodova, presented her children as her artworks. So uh, she spent five years in the academy and then uh, she gave birth to two of her children during this time. And for the, for the final exhibition, she dressed them in this golden uh, style clothing and brought them uh, to the opening as, as her art piece. Though it is rare, sometimes other artists use uh, their children as um, art pieces. And here uh, there is a very weird, in fact, uh, Eastern German duo, twin Gabriel. But this image it has, it has its way of connecting to me. So they used their child as a brush and the, and the work is called Kind als Pinsel. And um, yeah, the concept was something to something connected to the uh, dead air childhood of one of the parents, but the fact that they used really like used their child as a brush, I think, is very impressive and quite unusual. And their Eastern European film. Um, also uh, shows up when they work as a family. And when they had two children, they immediately started to include their children in their work. And so it's not about one artist anymore, it's a family, which often happens in the uh, Soviet and post Soviet countries. Because uh, in the Soviet Union, for example, there was a group uh, of uh, Natalia Balakova and Anatoly Zhigalov and their daughter Yeva. When she was born, they made uh, an art piece out of it. 
and um, they called this happening of her birth our best work of art. Like Lenka Klodova. Uh, here is another duo from Russia. Now one of the artists immigrated, another one still lives in Russia. And uh, I wanted to show their work samples because I feel like this is a very good feminist example of a female uh, collective. They're, they're not, unfortunately, they're not working together anymore, but they've made a lot of art as, as a couple and as a female uh, col collaboration. There were two friends, two artists, and they had children at the same time. And they both had daughters. And now their daughters are something like 16, 17 years old. But then when they were young mothers, new mothers, uh, they've been working with the topic of motherhood quite a bit. And uh, they have uh, an interesting video work that is available online and I highly recommend it. It's long, but it was it. Uh, it's called uh, Three Mothers and a Chorus, where they have three uh, women presenting different troubles of their motherhood. And then uh, a group of people uh, working as a chorus, chorus uh, that responds to them. And they're always wrong and they're always doing something not quite right. And uh, they're always um, not ideal. They can never be that ideal mother that society and it demands from them dreams to have in them as mothers. This is the chorus. There is always unhappy old woman who knows how to do better, unhappy child, unhappy man, women who are probably better mothers and so on and so on. It is always dramatic. There is always conflict in this being a mother state. And of course, while, taking, while talking about motherhood, it's also important to talk talk about uh, choices of women who um, choose not to um, perform this task, not to be mothers. Though, even when we're talking about this um, choice of not being a mother, uh, it's very clear that motherhood is political, but also not being a mother it's also highly politicized. And usually this choice, the, the way that Adrian Rich puts it in her book of Women Born, uh, women, women, woman's choices, her choices when she has any are made or out loud, out loud within the context of professional codes, religious sanctions, and ethics tradi ethic traditions. Um, all those things from whose creation women have been historically excluded. And um, here I have several examples. For example, this work of uh, Ukrainian artist Alina Kleitman uh, that is called uh, Today I Can and uh, where she talks about the, uh, her choice of not trying not to get pregnant. And of course, uh, the recent Polish uh, feminist and artist and art activist intervention that unfortunately wasn't exactly succeeding this time of uh, women uh, drowning in blood because of this um, new anti-abortion law 
that was uh, you know the story of this statue uh, until yesterday <laughs> yesterday i looked it up and uh, apparently uh, a there is a polish sculptor who really likes the pope uh, especially the Polish Pope, John Paul II, I think, if I'm not wrong. Paul II. Okay, maybe. The, there was one Pope who was from Poland and he was uh, in Vatican and everything. And there is a famous statue by Maurizio Catalan where the meteorite hits him and he's lying on the ground. The statue can be seen in the uh, credits of uh, the Young Pope show. And here the Polish sculptor made a response to this Maurizio Catalan's statue of, a, of this Pope holding the met meteorite, being more powerful than any uh, body coming from the sky and being able to hold it. And of course, um, women who are making an intervention to this fountain and, and this statue look like they're threatened by this pope who can throw everything at, at them. The religion, religious norms, rules, matter rights, whatever, they'll be drowning in blood around this Catholic figure. So, oh. and um, now I'm ready to uh, finish my speech. And here is also an interesting sample of uh, appropriation, re remaking of the famous Gorilla Girls, uh, a piece, The Advantages of Being a Woman Artist, The Advantages of Being a Woman Artist in Quarantine, made by Sanya Ivekovic. Uh, the time, times now are very peculiar, I think, for a lot of artists and a lot of people because this uh, attempt to maintain the border between personal and social between the private life and the social life, uh, this border now is almost unexistent. And uh, the longer this quarantine lasts, the longer we uh, would see this uh, intervention of private life into, into the social life. Uh, it started with uh, someone Skyping and then children were running into uh, the room. Today there, were, there was news about um, some lawyer accidentally attending the Zoom call uh, with the kitten filter and numerous jokes about it. And of course, art now is also not this spectacular social um, uh, event. Uh, even openings now are much more uh, timid and we are now are doing what we're doing, but we still exist in the realm of our private life. Uh, the spectacularity of this division is not there anymore and uh, maybe that's a good time to start a dialogue and to find some solution uh, to that. Um, I specifically uh, often think about how for example residences uh, that are supposed to um, encourage artists to have um, they're like boosting creativity are designed uh, to only welcome uh, people who have no responsibilities to children or other people. And this idea of the solo artist who's somehow independent uh, and uh, free uh, keeps 
uh, happening there. Even though it's very possible to try to include uh, such groups as um, women who have children and um, maybe that's a social responsibility and maybe we can see it not as just women having children but also any artist potentially uh, having children and um, taking care of uh, them and uh, this is my favorite example from the exhibition in 2015 where the playground was incorporated in the exhibition space and it immediately made this exhibition space more child friendly but also uh, the artist who did it, uh, Aksana Bruchavetska, very interesting Ukrainian artist who now lives in the States. Uh, she wrote a personal diary about her experience as a mother and visiting these playgrounds that can be the only social event for uh, women taking care of children, but also keeping her diary and maintaining her artistic practice. And she brought this uh, playground that is outside of uh, your personal life to the exhibition space and immediately made this exhibition space feel more private somehow and less public, but also more accessible to children who were actually able to play with the toys. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Uh, so let's open a discussion. Already saw some comments. Maybe someone has questions. Hello. <laughs> I'm not sure whether these reactions work. Yeah, I saw it. <laughs> but, um, I was wondering because you, because uh, uh, Marina, you gave so many different examples, and you know, I somehow, I mean, it they're kind of various, um, you know, like art historical references, but also contemporary examples that are pretty interesting. And I would like to know what is like your position. I understand that you're kind of looking at this uh, objectively, um, but like um, for me, it was really interesting that you kind of at the end of the lecture really said that there is this right of um, for women like not to have children or not to, you know, like in, in a political act. So I was just wondering because you gave so many different perspectives what is the what is your perspective that you are pursuing i mean i haven't checked your artwork um so like do you also deal with these questions or how did it come like to deal with these questions because usually you know mothers kind of uh deal with these questions you know it's not like that for example like i would like to see a you know like a father dealing with this question of kind of being a father kind of so it's yeah i too many questions, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, I was very surprised because uh, I wasn't expecting it. And when I gave, gave birth, I was 23 years old. And um, yeah, my film school professor wanted to exclude me at the time <laughs> for being pregnant uh, because the, the well it's it's still very dangerous for actresses for example if an actress gets pregnant her career is jeopardized but I thought that 
well, I'm not trying to be an actress, I'm trying to be a film director, so it shouldn't be a problem. But once I had to fight for that right, um, that became clear to me that, okay, we still have this idea uh, that, um, yeah, directors or artists or even academics are somehow this people who have no responsibilities, no private life, uh, no serious private life engagements. And whether they are women or men, uh, they should not bring their, their work to their work. But with men, it's easier. He is not uh, connected to your um, parenting. You can be a professional man, and no one will notice that you have children if you don't say so, or if you don't bring your children to work. But of course, if you're a woman and you're pregnant, it is immediately visible and that uh, that can not end your career but it puts it under under the threat in a way even now uh, i was advised by my i'm writing a phd and i was advised by my professor before the lockdown that i shouldn't uh, participate uh, in the colloquium of another professor when I'm sh sh just had my second child you're too visibly pregnant you shouldn't be it was a friendly advice it wasn't the authoritarian take on it but of course as a feminist I'm always thinking okay uh, where does it come from okay it probably comes from the idea that uh, the professional is never pregnant on, and why so? Because the professional, and when I was myself organizing um, artistic spaces and events, it was important uh, to think how we can incorporate women with children because uh, in order to hear the voices of artists uh, who, um, who have children or who think that their motherly identity is important, you need to provide some support for that. And it seems like it's rarely done. Yeah, I heard about some residencies for mothers, especially, and I sent this to my friends uh, who had children and they didn't apply because it, they, uh, they thought that it would um, not be good for their own career, like to, you know, be presented as a mother, which is really weird. I find, um, like, it's so weird that, like, you have such experience because, like, 23 years, like, this is kind of the best, like, you know, school way or school time to have children. So how could they possibly think that, you know, it's, it's so weird that today it's not, like, uh, normal that you have a child when you're 20. And, you know, uh, now it's normal to have it, like, when you're 35 plus, you know, till 45, kind of the very last kind of time ticking moment. So I, I find it's really weird that you were, uh, you know, like you had such bad experience with this. Uh, and especially what, what you said, like this visibly pregnant, like this is like, I think this, um, yeah, this kind of, I have to think about it a bit. Um, it's also interesting, like I, one thing I would like to mention is this uh, paid leave for uh, fathers. Like, for example, uh, Academy of Fine Arts, uh, I read, well, like, I think in 2019, there was some program uh, for the people, like, for, for the men, let's, let's say men, I mean, um, um, who, uh, you know, have kids, and somehow this program was there to promote that they take time with their kids, because not so many of them actually do. And uh, I found it really, yeah, 
it's just an example that we, because we were thinking there are some questions in the chat about uh, you know father or other members of the family is um kind of yeah so ideally there would be no um gender binary thing about parenthood and both parts will participate but also we need to stop like i think as a as an artistic community we still stigmatize people with children and children and i think it's a feminist issue i think that shouldn't be done this way especially in the like okay motherhood is some sort of utopian dream value like this child care and care of other people's lives others do but also art is this utopian area right we're trying to create spaces and places that do not exist in the society and so my i was thinking about the topic of your event and the self-care and care and i think in this caring way it's important to get just to de deconstruct this order between okay being involved in your private life but also being an artist yeah we artists art art is a precarious occupation why treat it as a um, like corporate career yeah by uh, our colleagues and some people by themselves <laughs> some people are doing one they by themselves you know they kind of uh don't present their own children into the art field because it's too problematic for their career you know so it's not only the others it's also us who have i mean yeah. i say us like some of us who kind of think that this is a huge thing you know in a, in it shouldn't a, be though it shouldn't be like i i really think that this is um this is very un, like uncool and i've been also thinking about the bullsh bullshitization of artistic sphere that is happening i think as every sphere right now reading david Greber's work bullshit jobs very interesting piece and he talks about how uh like people are forced to pe perform things that they uh, don't want to and even in spheres like um like research or philosophy or art where you have this sincere wish to do something like do art or do your research you also have to write a lot of um applications you you need to do a lot of paperwork a lot of bureaucracy and you just do it and you hate yourself and those like alienated spaces that are just there to reproduce this bullshit environment or also something that is typical for artistic sphere this like pyramids of people where if you have for example some bright artist or bright uh, professor you necessarily need to have like tons of assistance and tons of people that's supposed to support this figure on the top for some reason and they're also like just there because if we'll have one bright superstar artist without this surrounding she will look less spectacular and i mean I definitely have the feeling that uh... Uh, somehow the artists who are kind of well known and already established you know they're somehow like icons and like they're untouchable and so their private life is not known to us or even if it's not it's not so kind of important because uh, like you know the, the this hour of the artist is kind of the present but then like uh, the people who are you know kind of emerging artist or someone who wants to get in the scene you know like you shouldn't be presented as someone who has you know it, it's kind of nice to be free and not to have family because you know then you can i guess um 
um, you know, kind of uh, practice some exchange stuff for your career, whatever. So if you have, you know, I think that like having children in, <laughs> in, in the arts means, aha, uh -huh, so this person I cannot, if I may say like, fuck for, <laughs> you know, for the career, you know, but yes, like I, this is how I kind of see it in, in a way yeah, as well. I mean, this is just one of the aspects. Yeah, but that's like so problematic from the feminist point of view. It's really problematic. And we still have of course this, it is. <laughs> we still have this uh, yeah, field. But I think that Russian artists and especially Russian activists are Russian art activists are in the most vulnerable position. Of course, if you have a child, you don't want to go to prison for five years. That's like a serious threat. But if you are like an art activist, okay, what, like that's, that's the choice that people are facing at the moment. I can add uh, that last year in uh, Frankfurt, uh, I watched a very nice uh, video work also on this topic uh, where the artist uh, made a movie about like a video about her mother who also, uh, who, who is also an artist, but she, when she gave birth to uh, her, she started to uh, she started to say that okay i lost my artist practice because of you and you are my art now and uh, it was very kind of tough video and um because it was partly interview but the face of the mother was closed and in the beginning uh, the artist asked the mother can you in the end tell me like directly tell me that what you really uh, think about that, that uh, your, all your life you behave to me like that in this specific way that I, I was feeling a little bit guilty and you also like experiment on me. So it was also a very tricky way of living with a, because yeah, of course, you're losing part of yourself when you have a children, when you have children and you have to dedicate a lot of your time that, for example, you could dedicate to art practice or wherever just to have spare time. And... Yeah, but the time and yeah, I mean, I sympathize with this. I stopped doing art because I got children, but I think it's a little bit too dramatic. Uh, first of all, because this child care has its limits and once your children are seven or eight years old, it takes less time and then less, 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 less time. So it's, it's never your whole life, it's just your part of your life. And that also allows you to see things differently, do things differently, conceptualize things differently redistribute your time differently. And um, yeah, I don't know. Nowadays, it seems like all, all of the artists who are emerging artists or not very stable working artists that I know um, are forced to combine their main job and their artistic practice. So they're not just doing art and selling art. And uh, when thinking about that, um, I also think about the length of life, right? Life is long. And uh, in all the social researches that I've read about um, careers of women, it seems if you take this break uh, from art or from whatever you're doing, you can pick up later and you will be more invested in it later. For example, the most 
expensive male artist is Mark Rothko, I think, if I'm not like wrong, but I think I've recently read some research on it and his works are uh, 10 times more expensive than works of uh, most expensive female artists who would be Louis Bourgeois with her sculptures. But while thinking about their both of their career passes, of course, Mark Rothko is this like male artist, genius, working a lot, obsessively working, and then committing suicide. And uh, Louis Bourgeois is the female artist, working with her personal stories a lot. But she started her career really like in a very late age, as we can see now. And she, her, like, she was the most famous as an old woman. She wasn't that famous in her young years. And I think this is very optimistic thing right there, because you will still have a lot of time. And often if you're not succeeding in art in your young years and you do nothing but art and you would like try to sell your works and they're not selling that expensive or whatever is the problem there, you can drop it all together and start your corporate career. But if you're here and there doing something, there is a chance that you will be able to continue this like passionate <laughs> utopian intention beyond your young years. And that's the hope. So does anyone have any comments? or questions. I have a cat. Uh, I just thank you very much. This was very interesting. I am a mother with a small child, much later than you. <laughs> I got my small child, no. and I start now, like three years. Three years. I'm forty-three, and uh, I start now. I did some work with uh, with him in in the work, so this was like interesting also for me to see the works of the other artists who do uh, like work like this but i wanted to give a comment in that i seen like i was aware of this discrimination against women when they become mothers also before but since i became a mother i understood that it's like a, the, the life like how we live the systems the structures of the life like the work the i don't know whatever the supermarket the, everything it is not designed for a woman to have a kid and have a career. Like the, the, like to, you can have it both, but you really, you really struggle, you know, <laughs> and you kind of burn out, you know, during this, uh, okay, how to, you know, on 10 different sides, like spread. Uh, but in general, like it's not really there, you know, the structure or, or like to acceptance of like to be a mother and like exist outside uh, that, that role. Uh, I, I think this is missing in, and it definitely is a feminist uh, issue because also, yeah. Well, in art, yeah, I don't know about supermarkets, but about art and art communities that gather here and there. If I think if, if, if the art community has in mind this problem, it's possible to overcome it. And there are examples of this like acceptance and overcome, but then you need a lot of women 
involved and feminist women who are able to pro see a problem there. Hopefully it will change. That's my, that's my hope. Because of course the, mm -hmm. the problem is the patriarchal structure is very much patriarchal in its core. And this idea of a genius artist who is just 24 hours absorbed with its art, his art and working and working and working and is always accessible and always genius and but it seems like we've had enough of it right <laughs> need other yeah. other voices other stories yeah i find it no but there is particularly yeah sorry sorry like if you if we look like uh, 30 years ago and today you know there are like a lot of young uh, or mothers like artists who take their children with them you know uh, or who show themselves uh, with the children like in working environment or and uh, the much more than like in the 80s or 90s or even beginning on 2000 so this is kind of through this it's changing and also like that the curators when they when they accept uh, uh, like invite the womb artist who is a mother that they also create a, a space or leave the space for it that she can bring a kid that the kid can play there next to her while she's like uh constructing the they're not many like this but they are and of course they're mostly female curators but something is happening, you know, this is, I saw like uh, also a, a video from, from uh, one artist from Academy, she interviewed uh, women artists and, and uh, curators mm -hmm. who talked about this, this problem. I mean, there, something is happening and I think you can definitely look into the bright future <laughs> or brighter, but it's taking really baby steps, it's true very slow yeah but now for example with this lockdown even if we have two parents in the household and both of them are at home with children i think maybe things will change i don't know there is also this like hope no <laughs> no that is also the problem you know and why why the 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 women like when their parents are less in favor than the men who are parents because in practice also i mean it's connected with the prejudice of course and with ideas but in practice also the men just you know say hey i have work <laughs> you know and then you like yeah but the, the kid is sick hey i go to work so you don't have other option than to stay with the kid and then you do that. I know like I have friends and they, they, they tell me like when their kid is sick, it's them who stay at home, even when they're with partners because the partners have, they say, but I earn more money. Yeah, but now we all, so? all stayed at home for like a year. <laughs> Yeah, but the women did all the work. I, I was like really in a lot of groups and the reading and following, mm. it didn't really change much. It was even worse because they have to, you know, even take care of the husbands for the whole day. I, I can uh, add to this topic. There, there is a very <laughs> okay. funny, uh, uh, there is very funny uh, Soviet movie about that when the Kirin garden is closed because of the quarantine and the parents uh, have to manage mm -hmm. how, what to do with their kid uh, because both of them have to work and then they bring it first uh, father stayed then uh, father is like run away early in the morning and mother has to stay but she was uh, she was doing kind of a science uh, career in the science and was writing, uh, and she's writing her thesis. So they brought uh, the kid to their parents and they also didn't want to sit. 
with him so yeah and the whole movie like that but i also wanted to say that uh, in i think in 60s and 70s soviet union was a uh, practice to stay in kindergarten uh, for the whole week so to sleep in the kindergarten yeah and yeah. For example, my father and uh, they were sleeping in kindergarten and uh, parents were free for the whole, kind of free, they worked, but their evenings was free. And I think it was very kind of helpful, helpful for parents. And, but I discussed it with some of my friends and they were really against this practice. But I don't have kids, uh, so I cannot say anything. I have only my brother. My, I could say I raised a little bit, but this is not the, <laughs> yes. But what do you think about this practice? But I think this was the, yeah, this was the idea, like the, this very strict communist idea to, to like, the, so the children get uh, tougher and not to develop this kind of um, uh, emotional um, attachment. Yeah, yeah, like to have a strong connection, but to be tough mm. by themselves. Yeah, this is like, um, it comes from this, I think, but yeah. I, I can see how that helped a woman to be like, like at least the work she had, you know? Mm. I don't know. Was it before? Sorry, oh, I, was I just before. Uh, like feel like in art. Uh -huh. I'm not sorry, I think my internet is very bad. <laughs> sorry. Was it before what? I meant uh, before the communism when uh, uh, children uh, were used I'm, to be I'm like wondering thing. about one thing. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. I think there's some glitch going on. <laughs> I keep wondering like whether uh, a feminist art would be possible without dealing with your own life circumstances. You mean talking about personal? Yeah, I mean like somehow um, it seems to me that like, you know, um, women are more open to include their personal experience and their life circumstances into their art. And somehow I keep wondering what would be the feminist art without these topics, without this dealing with your own um, kind of, you know. Then, you know, it, you know life, like, like art becomes like, um, not only like therapy okay it, it also becomes like part of asking the question and raising the awareness and like you know i, I just find like it's just a thought how will it look like you know hmm. well there is this like post-humanist art that is very interesting and just thinking beyond the humanity and there are feminist philosophers and feminist artists who are interested in this strain and I think it's like more and more popular these days just going beyond human then you don't need to talk about stories Donna Har Harway as one example of a feminist philosopher who is widely used and she's talking about other species and technology, things like that. The thing is that with motherhood, it, it, it is present. It's very present in the social sphere. 
and it like also it's present in art and there are lots of male artists who work with the, their childhood for example working with their childhood is somehow commonplace and I think that's the, the important thing is that to let women define what motherhood is or what parenthood is, how do they see themselves? Let them like represent themselves and speak for themselves. Because if we uh, like leave it to others or not talk about it at all, we end up with this um, perfect pictures, advertisements that uh, make it seem all like it is not problematic, not difficult, uh, also empty and deserves no respect and things like that. Or that like women all dream to be mothers, for example, that is also not true. And uh, when we have uh, a lot of voices and a lot of art pieces that are produced by women, then there is a different picture that that's that's my uh, dream <laughs> that a lot of women will contribute and then this imagery this imagined uh, del delusion will be somehow yeah, deconstructed and the question is whether um, dealing with this, uh, um, it, it's kind of good in a way, but like, you know, it brings into awareness. But then on the other hand, it's this kind of typical thing to deal with these topics only because you're a woman, you know, like uh, I'm just trying to, you know, kind of look at it from several perspectives. And then like uh, then, like in, in, if we understand it like this, then there is like this uh, moment of, uh, I as a woman, I, I'm accepting to deal with these topics only because I'm a woman. And then it becomes this kind of, it's kind of feeding the, the machine, you know, in a very weird sense, this is how I see it. But uh, I don't know, I've, for example, I've been reading, um, Maggie Nelson recently and her book, Ar The Argonauts. It's very private life oriented. And at the same time, she's a scholar and she writes about philosophy there. Uh, I don't know, it just seems to me uh, that this ideas of family she's a fam the the author i'm talking about she's a feminist she lives in the us and she's a queer feminist um works a lot with deconstructing all the gender norms in her literature as i see it and um yeah like she writes about this necessity to have the queer family and what is the queer family? How do we desire something that is not patriarchal? And why do we claim certain things as patriarchal or so like family is bad? I don't know mothers can be professional like where all these constructions come from and how can we reclaim them if we want to reform them it's in, an interesting question and of course it's and then i get the idea that women are forced into this discussion but <sighs> women are often forced to think about those things just in the societies unfortunately are we reinforcing this by bringing it to the 
social sphere to the discussion by taking it out of our private lives? That's that's the question that I I for myself I answer that it's, it's an interesting topic. We should discuss it and probably if I feel that uh, this is not appropriate, probably that's like my own uh, idea of what is appropriate and what is not is also this like male idea in a way. I don't know, it, it seems like I'm not very coherent at the moment. <laughs> Why not? Let's start reinforcing Yes, Yelena, I think we're finished. Um, I think also my internet is dying and dying. Yes, so um, thank you very much, Marina. I hope uh, sooner or later you can come to Vienna. <laughs> Maybe we can finally do something together. Yes, and uh, thank you all for your time. It was yeah, I've seen that someone met. Someone mentioned uh, Chris Krause and her I Love Dick book. Is still there? Mm -hmm. Is still there? Yes. No? Madame Scorpio. Okay. Yes. We're all sometimes this I Love Dick story. <laughs> yes, Chris Krause is also there. Yeah, she's she's very she's she's bringing her personal life to her narrative. It's very personal. So, but at the same time, it's. Yeah, Madame Scorpio wants to say something. I don't know your name, so... Theory. Okay. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for the lecture. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I think it's just... Uh... Sasha. Hi, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that I think it's like, um, it's a bit of a cliche, uh, which comes from the prep on when they finally started, actually were able to produce more and show more. And they uh, started really uh, working a lot with their own body, kind of got their body back which also is very much like connected to motherhood as a capacity of the body. So I think um, that's the point, like why we all know this kind of stuff as like feminist art. Like you ask anybody, what is feminist art? It would be this kind of stuff. Um, motherhood or like uh, your approach to your own bodily functions. But I think it's not like that anymore. Or at least it should go just forward um, generally from not only from the position of women, but I think also like, it's a question if men can do feminist art in the sense kind of flipping and starting finally losing their power in a way like starting opening up to speaking about private things as well, such as their body or their parenting or their like everyday life experience. And on the other hand, like, I guess now you have many, many examples of women who, um, are, for example, queer and don't deal necessarily with this uh, topic of motherhood or 
like the art can still be feminist. I, I'm just thinking about Nicole Eisenman, for example, like a famous painter who is whose works are highly like feminist, but they and they do deal with private life a, a, a lot, like because she's painting her in her studio with her lover and stuff like that. But it's not; it doesn't have to deal with this kind of cliche practices. So I think we are now slowly moving beyond that also which doesn't make it a, a bad thing to talk about it, but it's, it's, it's my just remark to like, if it's possible to do feminist art without touching private life, it can be st still done in a different way, I guess, I don't know. Yeah, but I think that also we should start, like, why, why make the, private life something that is un unspeakable i think the uh the more relaxed we are about this dis distance and definition of private and social or personal and theoretical and non-personal political and th things like that the more borders are uh, blurred the better because there is never ever like pure conceptual art untouched by life the moment you dig into diaries hope here it is <laughs> all, all very much interconnected okay it's like this uh this uh, Zoom inter in interruptions, all the all the big male uh, things happening today with the. Have you seen the kitten filter already? Some lawyer accidentally uh, put a kitten filter on his face on the working Zoom and wasn't able to get rid of it. And this one was recorded and it's online. So yeah, like kitten face on Zoom, all this like pretentious male occupy, like Bernie Sanders wearing those uh, homey, homely meetings <laughs> on meetings and things like this. All the big public uh, events now are weirdly transformed into this private private-ish personal oh yeah that was as well private life is never outside <laughs> Okay, so I think. Thank you so much. I'm yeah. happy to see everyone. And it's a lot of fun to work on this topic. Thank you. And have a nice evening, all. Oh.